Hello, I'm Michael Rader, Producing Artistic Director of the Cape Playhouse, and welcome to tonight's episode of Behind the Playhouse Curtain. Now, last week, last episode, we heard from our production manager and technical director, Dan Whiting, who stepped us through the process of how the sets, once they are designed, how they get created at the Cape Playhouse. And tonight, we are actually going to hear from two of our creative teams for shows that were initially supposed to be part of our 2019 season. Those shows are American in Paris and Murder on the Orient Express. And we're going to hear from those creative teams about how they go about the process of the design. So uh, enjoy. Welcome to the conversation now, our uh, inc incredible, legendary costume designer. She's done over 20 productions at the Cape Playhouse, Miss Gail Baldoni, and our wig and hair designer making her Playhouse debut, Amber Morrow. Yay. <laughs> hello. <laughs> hello. Hello, hello. Hello. This production has, what I love about it is the diversity in the cast. There's like 10 um, really fun, dynamic, exciting characters. And I would imagine that from a design standpoint, Amber, you're designing the wigs and the hair, um, Gail, the costumes. It must be a really fun jumping off point to start having those conversations amongst the three of you uh, about where the design is going to be, let alone that it's you know, 1930s elegance and glamour. Um, I would imagine this is a really fun, uh, if not daunting, also really exciting um, design process. I think so many of these characters, you know, there's a little bit of, it's like, they're very eccentric, each one of them, but no one is really who they really are. So you kind of want to come at it with a mindset of like, who are they trying to present themselves as when we first meet them? And for me, anything that's like an ensemble cast, you don't really want someone to pop out. You kind of want the design to be tight and the colors to be controlled so that it is realistic and they're not too cartoony or over the top in that regard, that you want to honor the time period and these are real people and focus on the story of, you know, the romance and the tragedy and the clothes should be believable, but do what they need to do as far as anytime there's a murder, we're probably going to have some blood or things we have to sort out with costumes and, and um, running of the show. So there's a lot of challenges you know, getting just the right look. And even though it's only two days, it's about 28 different costume looks for those 10 actors and some different things. So yeah. out. they're all very wealthy people, or mm -hmm. at least um, they've been given a, a, a trunk of clothes to kind of pull from to create their characters. But the, the fun thing to go through the script is to start backwards, who they really are, and then layer on top of them what their level of uh, subterfuge is. So some of them are more subtle than others, mm -hmm. but it is so much fun. And 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 hair takes a journey in that regard as well, right? We oh no, I was just gonna say for the wigs in this show specifically, it is so much fun for me because everything is so stylized. Even the characters that are supporting other very wealthy characters are still very stylized just to the period. From makeup to the palettes to everything is so particular that it's literally a dream to A, work in this era, but specifically work on a show where the evolution of the characters is so vast. So I'm super excited. I know. <laughs> this is also I get the 30s. It's exactly. such a beautiful decade. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, it, the glamour aspect in this decade and particularly with the Countess, mm -hmm. Gail gets to sort of dress her in her most uh, 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 sort of glamorous princess superstar of the decade kind of way. And that's really exciting. And it's just fun, the different ages of the characters we have, you know, from 20s to 80, you know, there's such a range of yeah. the people and, you know, the um, conductor, the uniforms, you know, the, the clues that have to happen in, within the costumes a little bit. Like the mustache is such a big thing, but, you know, he uses his wax later on for something. So you have to have a waxed mustache for our leading man. You know, there's things yeah. that you have to honor the script. You know, that's where you always bounce off of first, what has to be in there to tell the story. And then how do we finesse it to our production with this cast and, you know, what they bring to the table. Hmm. So Amber and Gail, be honest, when you're doing something like um, a chorus line, everyone sort of has a uniformity of style. Everyone's coming from New York City. Everyone's dressing the same. These are individuals, 10 individuals from very different 
um, geography, different areas, different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Um, while the dresses, yes, and the hair and the styles, I would assume, are all 1930s, they're all coming from different parts of the world almost. Mm -hmm. Is that more daunting to you as a designer or is that more exciting? Well, I think you want to jump on that. And, and you know, <laughs> Hungarian or, you know, Belgian, they make such a point. I'm not French, I'm Belgian. You know, you're so proud about it. So if you can find little tiny hints that are ethnically correct, I think those are wonderful clues to the character mm -hmm. where they're from or where they're pretending to be from. And like our little Greta, mm -hmm. she's, you know, she's been working in Africa and she seems to be our most modest person. Mm -hmm. So to find a, a, a look for her that uh, authenticates her in her, in her culture and her uh, abilities is, is really a great contrast to somebody like Helen Hubbard or Princess Dragomirov or mm -hmm. one of, you know, the Countess. And it's fun too, because we have day wear and then we have several characters in evening wear, you know, getting mm -hmm. their um, compartment. Well, they would dress for dinner, even if they're walking down the corridor to go to the dining car. I mean, there mm -hmm. were rules. Everybody's seen Downton Abbey. Everybody gets dressed mm -hmm. up for dinner in that time and in that culture. And, um, you know, they're, they that's why the luggage, I'm telling you, the <laughs> luggage is another character. We've got, you know, mm -hmm. it's like knowing when you get on a train, if you're going to Grand Central and you're at the Amtrak, you're going to spot the Louis mm -hmm. Vuitton luggage, mm -hmm. right? Versus exactly. the backpacks and the rollers. <laughs> so we have that same sense of um, class system that we're going to mm -hmm. analyze as well. So I want to bring into the, the discussion now our amazing scenic designer, Mr. Nate Bertoni. Hey, Nate. Hi. So, Nate, do you remember when I when I first called and talked to you about this and said, I want to do American in Paris and I want to make it our own? I do. I do. Yeah. And I remember um, I remember sitting down with you all for the first time in the first meeting we ever actually had. Michael, you and I at a coffee shop on the Upper West Side um, and then all of us together when we met as a design creative team and just went through research, um, which was really, really exciting to, at the beginning of the process, though we didn't have the entire team that we have today, um, to just have the opportunity to dream about what the show could be. Mm. We talked about Broadway, we talked about what we wanted the show to become, especially for a premiere on, on the Cape. Uh, and I was so inspired by that meeting and I'm excited to share with you guys today a little bit of how we got to where we are now. One of the first ideas you had, which I just thought was so such a great jumping off point, was for all of us to bring together a bunch of production images that invoked the feeling, the style that we wanted to convey in, in our version of American in Paris. And I remember my apartment on the Upper West Side, we all got together and we threw a bunch of pictures on my table. We had this entire table covered with how all of us saw uh, this production of American in Paris. And that was just, I loved working like that. Um, and then you brought some incredible images to uh, the table that day, um, and let's bring them up now. Uh, let's let's sure. show through some of these some of these uh, these pictures that you brought for us. A lot of what we what we have here today is pared down from honestly hundreds of images that all of us had brought to the table. Um, so we selected images through just everyone's lens of what they felt American in Paris was going mm. to be, and some of these images were so striking that they ultimately inspired where my head was going as we were having the conversations. And specifically, this image, these are actually paired together, um, the man on the street creating a painting of Paris, and then the young boy inside this kind of cardboard structure, which just felt so mm. artistic and playful. Uh, and the way that he saw the world it kind of felt like mini canvases there. Um, and as we were going through the images, the images just kept expanding into what we ultimately turned so far towards, which some of them were the architecture and the lines of Paris. And also just, I mean, this woman on the right struck me so, <laughs> she, she just made me laugh and she gave me the joy of some of the numbers in America Paris and the look and expression on her face, just staring at art. Um, and yes, we can see what is in that frame is a little bit comical, but uh, the joy that comes from experiencing art as a viewer mm. uh, was something that I paid a lot of attention to. And something here, if we're looking at the post-war Paris, mm. uh, I was just finding decay and images in that world in black and white that were interesting. 
but then also looking through the lens of a window and an apartment and just mm -hmm. seeing a portion of the world and a portion of Paris was really striking to me too. So it felt like a canvas, uh, if you will, that that square of the window was a canvas painting of a part of Paris there. It's, yeah, it's. I think what's important to remember is that it was at the end of the war. I mean, Paris had been devastated at that point. It was. It was. It was a. It was not Paris as we know it today. It was a much darker Paris that was climbing out of the ashes, both literally and, and figuratively. Absolutely, and something in uh, inspired by how we were having a conversation with Jason and and the movement of the piece. Mm. As an artist, I felt, beautiful. well, what if Jason was doing his beautiful choreography, which as we've seen before, he's uh, quite spectacular. And if I was to just trace him and trace his dancers uh, with a pencil or a paintbrush and what the lines of the body would do naturally, which are in juxtaposition to the structural lines of the Eiffel Tower, for example. So looking at as an artist, the free form line compared to as an architect or a builder of worlds, um, what the hard lines do. So definitely looking at images like this that were uh, inspired by movement. And then again, back to <clears throat> looking at architecture. So can we take architecture that is hard lines and then take it into a world that is done, let's say by Jerry, um, as he is a painter and an artist, uh, what would his view and what would his lens of the story be if he was to have painted the world himself? So then going from our dream meeting, which was so inspiring, this is a very, very rough uh, on my sketch pad. I was actually, I think at this time I was flying to London for a production I was mounting for Beowulf for it of Be More Chill. You were, and, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, what a better time to have been able to. <laughs> Aww. Um, <laughs> Little did we know. But um, we're in Paris right now, or at least I, right. <laughs> I am. Um, so this was just on the airplane as I was sketching, and it's you know rough and uh, tumbling everywhere. But it was this idea inspired by an image that we fell in love with in the dream meeting there, which is this man, I'm going to call him Jerry, uh, painting on the cobblestone corner of the street with a, a canvas on an easel, just looking out. And right there, if you can imagine in your mind's eye buildings like the street behind you in the research image, kind of curving away from us. And then from the corner there, which is just black Sharpie on this, um, taking one of those canvases and then imagining how many of these canvases Jerry has made as a painter. Mm and just throwing them to the wind and letting them like the sweeping nature of some of this music in there and the orchestrations, just let it sweep away and let's see where the paint, the paintings land. Mm -hmm. um, so then I would just kept going and kept playing. Once I was off the airplane, this was just a pen mm -hmm. sketch on a piece of paper, uh, which was that idea of, do we put it in a box? Do we actually have structure mm -hmm. of the Parisian streets or is it just a white canvas box? And then there's a canvas collage. And something that Michael and I were responding to was that in the devastation of Paris during the post-war time, we wanted to see a little bit of architecture uh, so that we didn't deplete the world of what Paris felt like at that time. So where we are right now in the process uh, and where we may end up next year, who knows, uh, is we started building a 3D model which is just a white model right now, which is inspired uh, all by the research that we've done so far, which is of this sweeping, uh, two sweeping curves essentially, the Parisian street, which right now is, looks like a white model of flats, uh, but has the detail in the world of those buildings and architecture of the streets. And then the canvases that sweep from upstage to downstage and up into the proscenium there. And the idea that we're playing with right now is that these canvases uh, are different elements in the locations that we go. So the back of one canvas may take us to a cafe, the ballet studio, and some of them may be windows and they're pieces of Paris through Jerry's lens. Um, so each, as you can see there, are all just floating canvases. And the idea is that when we move through the show to give Jason as much space for his gorgeous choreography, the set is really landed in just paintings. What are the paintings that Jerry would have created of each of these locations and how do we illuminate the sweeping orchestrations and the music and then the choreography? 
Beautiful. I, I'm so excited by this design because I love that it really takes, I mean, we have a, we have an intimate space at the, at the Playhouse. It's not a massive, massive uh, stage, mm -hmm. but I think that works to our advantage here because it brings the intimacy back to this piece. Um, and we have a, you've created a space that really opens up the playing area for us mm -hmm. in, in a way that will highlight Jason's choreography and our lighting design will help mm -hmm. that as well. And I think it will just be, I think it'll be majestic. I think it will be in this space. Um, it, it will just be really, really, really stunning and beautiful when we, uh, when we open things up as we keep saying. And so um, we start tomorrow, right? This is getting <laughs> me very excited. I'm ready. I don't know about you guys. Oh, let's do I it. Wish. Well, I hope you enjoyed going behind the scenes tonight and hearing from our creative teams about the truly fascinating process of how these sets and costumes and how they go about getting, getting created. Join us next week for a very special behind the scenes interview with Tony Award winner Jefferson Mays, who's currently starring as all of the roles in the version of A Christmas Carol that we are currently streaming. Uh, you can get that information on our website. So join us next Monday at five o'clock for an exclusive behind the scenes interview with Jefferson Mays. Until then, from all of us at the Cape Playhouse, have a really wonderful, safe and healthy week. Take care.